The stretch of 185 miles country from Washington, D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland, is one of the most fascinating and picturesque in the nation, a wilderness area where we can commune with God and nature, a place not yet marred by the roar of wheels and the sound of horns. Supreme Court Justice William Douglas said these words in 1954, sharing his love for the old Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. The canal stood little more than a muddy trench, with its existence threatened by the planned extension of the George Washington Parkway. Douglas, a dominating force in American politics for 40 years, set out to hike the entirety of the canal to raise awareness for his favorite getaway destination. But what was this old contraption that a leading public figure was crusading to defend? Let's explore the history of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal and the men and women who lived their lives along its 185 miles. I have now to perform the more pleasing task of exhibiting an imperfect sketch of the existing state of the unparalleled prosperity of the country. On a general survey, we behold cultivation extended, the arts flourishing, and the face of the country improved. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was born out of American expansion. As the nation grew, the immense resources gained needed infrastructure to get to the factories of booming American industry. One more cog in the wheel of Speaker of the House Henry Clay's American system, the Sino Canal was nearly disregarded in the laissez-faire presidency of James Monroe. However, after years of negotiation, the canal was at last chartered in 1824. He told me that it was pretty rough going. Saturday was payday and he said that on Saturday night they all used to get drunk and take to fighting and sometimes the National Guard would have to come to quieten down. Otto Swain. Construction of the canal began on July 4th, 1828, with President John Quincy Adams symbolically breaking ground. Though originally designed to reach the Ohio River in Pittsburgh, limited funding and engineering practicality set the final destination at Cumberland, Maryland. 35,000 laborers spent 22 years constructing the full canal. As impressive a feat as this was, the very foundation of the canal was built on shaky soil. The same day that construction of the canal began, work started on the building of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The canal was caught on the wrong side of progress and would forever be overshadowed by its similarly named rival. As construction of the canal ended, its period of prosperity began. Though operations started long before the canal was fully completed, the canal's success exploded once it ran in its entirety. Boats floated massive amounts of coal and other resources from Cumberland down to Washington, D.C., while towns along the canal, such as Georgetown and Great Falls, grew rapidly. However, flooding in 1852 and 1857, coinciding with economic downturns, shed light on a grim future to come. But for the time being, the canal turned to profit though the dark storm clouds of civil war rose on the horizon. Before New Year's, General Jackson made several trips to Dam No. 5 on the Potomac for the purpose of destroying it, and thereby impairing the efficiency of the C&O Canal. Henry Kidd Douglas The canal became a point of contention as the Civil War broke out. Early on, Confederate cavalry repeatedly crossed the river to burn boats, damage locks, and steal horses. During the Antietam campaign, Robert E. Lee ordered the Monocacy Aqueduct destroyed, an operation which failed due to a lack of equipment. These threats led to the permanent garrison of Yankee soldiers and artillery along the canal. Though the loss of business early in the war proved costly, the canal company reaped the benefits of Union success as the war ended, and in the ensuing post-war boom saw its traffic soar and debts slide off its ledgers. The canal's great success lasted until 1873. In that year, floods swept through the canal, this time coinciding with the largest economic depression 
in 30 years. The company remained profitable, but more and more clients moved their cargo onto rails. As the depression dragged on, demand for the coal that the canal shipped dropped, leading to strikes and severe budget cuts. 1877 saw an even larger flood than four years prior, and it was all but a miracle that the canal stayed open. Droughts and strikes followed, which brought the canal to its knees. At last, a catastrophic flood in 1889 pushed the canal into insolvency, and was kept operating on the whim of the B&O Railroad, for no other reason than to keep it from falling into a competitor's hands. The canal would operate for 35 years after the Great Flood of 1889, but its glory days had ended. From a historical perspective, the canal was a small footnote in the American epic, but for those running the boats and locks of the canal, it was everything. Let's jump to the year 1916 and journey from Cumberland to Georgetown along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal and delve into the marvelous lives of the people who lived along its banks. This was Captain Samuel Spong, boat number 74, a small boat, the Windship. Our journey into the life along the CNO Canal will follow Samuel Spong. At an ordinary captain, Spong traveled with his wife and four kids. The beginning of any trip down the canal was Cumberland. Never a large town, Cumberland nevertheless served as the connecting point between the resources of Appalachia and the markets of Georgetown. A canal boat would be filled to the brim with freight, mostly coal, and the soft currents of the canal would glide it out of Cumberland. Mules were used to maintain sufficient speed, often driven by young boys. A solid pace would have the boat tethered in Sharpsburg by nightfall. The bunks didn't sleep too good because all you had was straw tick in the bunk. That's all. That wasn't too good. I never knew anybody having a mattress. J.P. Mose. Nights were tough on the canal. After a hard day's work, a boatman could not look forward to the comforts of a mattress. Only a bunk lined with straw. The air was thick and humid, and the sleeping quarters were tight to say the least. The oppressive Maryland summers made spending the night in a tavern just marginally more accommodating. Some boats kept going through the night, with crews taking shifts to stay rested. The chains were long enough to allow considerable movement, but not long enough for any chance of falling overboard. Elizabeth Keitel Children from infanthood were present on the canal. When too young to help, they spent their days on the decks of the canal boats. Since the cabin air of midday was dangerously hot, tying them to the boat, as dehumanizing as it sounds, was a critical practice that saves young children from drowning in the canal. Once they were old enough, about nine, the boys worked as mule drivers, and the girls helped their mothers with cleaning and cooking. Provided that an adequate pace was kept, a load of coal could be moved from Cumberland to Georgetown in a week. Once the journey was over, it was time to turn around and head home. Captain Spong dropped off his freight and headed back up the canal. Spong would make it home, but the same could not be said for his family. They locked out in the river at Rock Creek, and the wind ship took them up to the powerhouse. There was a concrete wall where the boats pulled up, and a pipe came out of the wall for blowing the boiler off. All that steam forced right into the boat, straight into the cabin. The undertaker from Sharpsburg came up for the three children, and took them to Sharpsburg and buried them. Captain Spong never boated again after that. J.P. Mose. The death of Spong's children was emblematic of the fall of the canal. In 1924, a catastrophic flood tore through the Potomac, ruining houses, stores, and boats, while rendering the canal damaged beyond repair. It sat for three decades, occasionally used for recreation, but never truly appreciated. Thanks to the work of William Douglas, the canal was taken in by the National Park Service, repaired, and turned into a massive park. Today, five million tourists a year visit the canal. Throughout its history, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal has survived intact, and its rich history and scenic majesty will forever stand a shining example of human innovation, willpower, and resilience. I ain't got no whiskey, but I will have some honey.
Uh-huh. I ain't got no whiskey, but I will have some when this boat gets to Washington. It's a honey, oh darling of mine. All along the canal you're going to be able to see beautiful little farms and the villages that sprang up along the canal. Forbes, grasses. down the Queen's Way. I'm enjoying this path quite a bit. I like it better than the waterfront. It is much less traffic. I don't mind that it's right next to the highway because the waterfront is too. And look how gorgeous it is. There's a ravine, there's the park lawn in the Queensway, and this is the access point to this incredible, I don't know what it's called, Lower Humber Trail or something like that. So I'm gonna go down it. Check it out, this is where it gets really, really, really cool. If you take this path, you end up at the canal. Now I'm from a place where there is no canals. And so this to me is, woo, So I'm gonna park my bike around here in the bush. I'm gonna cruise down the canal and see what I find. At that point, my handheld uh, mobile device uh, lost its battery power, and then I dropped it in the creek. It's a pretty good thing that it happened in that order. Um, I had a great time. I bagged up all this crazy garbage that I found, destroyed a whole bunch of mosquito habitat, put the garbage at the head of the trail, and called the people at 311 to come and get it and uh, played around in the bamboo patch which is really hard to photograph because it's so dark in there but it was really nice on like that was the hottest day of the summer so far and I was as cool as a cucumber in the forest there it was wonderful it was, I had a good time
up ahead, point of rocks. Up ahead is the crossing of the old main line. It's diagonal crossing. To the right behind the camera goes east back to Baltimore. And that way's facing west towards the station. And we'll soon be at the station. Now here we are at Point of Rocks on a very mild December day. Almost 60 degrees out here, very warm. Full house. And look what we're about to do. This late in the year, we're going bike riding on the CNO Canal. Again, the Point of Rocks train station. Now we're facing east. But as I pan towards the west, we'll see a train is coming. heading towards DC. Now we're behind the Point of Rock Station. This building over here, this utility building, actually predates the station right there. But before going to the canal, how about a free run by?
now on a side road. Also up ahead, we pass beneath the US-15 bridge. South to the left, north to the right. Also up ahead, the point of rocks tunnel of the CSX. Now we're curving around the rock spur that gave Point of Rocks its name. And another freight train coming. train. That was a very long train. I had to edit this sequence. Even though there's a tunnel through that mountain spur right there, there's one track that curls around the mountain for extra clearance in the tunnel. The westbound track goes through the tunnel and this here, the eastbound track, curls around the tunnel. Like I said, more clearance that way. Again, facing west. Almost northwest, actually. We're now about to curve to the north. We have a rocky and rooty towpath right here. Got to go a bit slower. Still facing north. But up ahead once again, we curve back to the west. As you can see the Potomac River doing. Pull commuter train heading for a stop in Brunswick a few miles up the path. Hopefully, we'll get there too. Now arriving at Lander's Lock. Now post 51. Actually, that's our third one. I didn't catch the last two on tape. Another train. Another push-pull commuter train on its way to Washington. And up here, the ruins of the Catoctin Aqueduct. It collapsed in 1973. And there'd be an bridge behind it. But we go this way. Catoctin Creek. A 
again the B&O bridge. And now we're starting the curve back to the west. Now we're in Brunswick and the route to 287 bridge right up there. Of course, south to the left, north to the right. The Bells of Brunswick. We'll bring in Brunswick by day and later on this tape, by night. Isn't that special? Up here's the commuter station. Got a couple of helper locomotives there, just passing through. Better get back to our van while there's still some sunlight. It'll be a bit dark upon arrival, something tells me. Now departing Brunswick Yard. On our bikes again, heading back to the canal for the trip back to our van. And finally, here comes something.
finally got a train. Hopefully more to come later. Okay, back to the van while we can. We're now about to head back east on the CNO Canal. Here we go. And locomotives are still idling up there. Actually, they're pushers. They help freights go up grades. Then they back off. I'll wait for the next freight. That same locomotive is still idling there. That was there on a trip up. And again, another train is coming. Another commuter train. Well, the train is approaching. You may hear a crossing bell ringing in the distance, as well as the train. Now we're back at Lander's Lock. And here we go. Pull train and reverse. And again, Lander's lock. Nice purple sky up above. And again, a train. Heading towards Brunswick. was a regular Amtrak passenger train, not a commuter train as before. Got my headlight on now. You can almost tell. Now at the crossing, the same place we were stuck in March of 97 and the train is again coming train heading west as we're looking east train, again bound for Brunswick, and some Christmas lights, a 
end of their ride. Okay, let's load up. Dolly's tired. They're probably hungry also. Now departing the Point of Rocks commuter parking lot, right down there. Now entering Brunswick and down by the station again. We were here earlier on our bikes. It's stopping as they all do. We have a train coming down here on the eastbound tracks. Earlier, we came here with our bikes, and we stopped to rest right there. Long train, still going by. Slow down a bit, too. The gates just came down. I guess something's coming. We're facing west, but nothing there. But looking to the east, another freight.
another train right down here on the eastbound track. And there it is, heading this way. Come on, go for it. Yes. Coming my way. And to think, I was standing on that track. The gates just came down on the eastbound tracks. Let's check it out. Let's look west and see what's coming. Check that out. Here it comes.
And something is also about to pass on the westbound tracks. Right up here. Commuter train from Washington stopped at the station. And down there, the helpers. The train went in reverse direction and back up on this track to be ready for a Monday's run. This is Friday night. And here it comes. Those same helpers are about to pass down there, not pulling some cars. Again, it's stopping.
hope I'm getting some good stereo effects. End of that one. That's that same train backing up on a different track. On the locomotive there, it says Electromotive, the factory that built it. I'm looking westbound, another train. I guess the gates will come down soon. two switchers down there. Doing their thing. peak at Brunswick Station, and again the bells of Brunswick 